Great. Uh, good to see you all again. Thank you for uh, coming back. Um, so, welcome to the second lecture in the series on dependently typed functional programming in Idris. So, I've given you the introduction yesterday. I've given you a sort of quick run through of all uh, of, of many of the features of Idris. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, today and tomorrow. I'm going to talk about things you can actually do if you have a uh, dependently typed programming language. In particular, today, I'm going to talk about one of the things that interests me most, which is um, implementing embedded domain-specific languages. So uh, it might seem strange, I suppose, to uh, implement you know, a programming language just to have another language to implement other languages in. But hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll, uh, you'll see why that is a valuable thing to do. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of history of, uh, of programming languages and abstraction. Um, and then we'll go on to one of the uh, kind of the hello world examples of dependently typed programming is, is the well-typed interpreter. So this is an interpreter for a simply typed lambda calculus that, that where, where programs just by their existence are a, proof, are a proof that they are type correct. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, then we'll go on a bit further and I'll show how to make it more uh, easy to program in these kinds of embedded languages. And one thing um, towards the end uh, of how we can use embedded domain specific languages to do uh, resource correctness proofs. So when I talk about resources, I'm talking about things like uh, file handles, memory usage, locks in concurrent programming, the kind of things where um, if you mismanage them for whatever reason, so if you mismanage locks in concurrent programming, so you might end up taking too many locks, you end up with deadlock. So I'm going to show some possible approach to uh, uh, managing that kind of situation. So just to start, uh, let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what we mean by you know, uh, languages and abstraction. So in computer science, we're always talking about abstraction. So uh, as far as uh, you know, normal um, people are concerned, English speakers, uh, abstraction is... Um, this is the definition I got from um, uh, the dictionary. It's, it's the process of considering something independently of its associations or attributes. So um, uh, as far as computer science is concerned, that's just, um, uh, this is the definition I got from um, Ron Morrison's PhD thesis. So Ron Morrison was the uh, uh, former head of department at St. Andrews University, so uh, uh, still around an emeritus professor, retired now, but our, our old head of school. This, this is the best definition I found, uh, best computer science definition I found was from his thesis. It says, a process of extracting the general structure to allow the inessential details to be ignored. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of when I was uh, learning about computing back in the 1980s. There was, uh, was a very nice books on how computers worked for children, the kind of things you don't really seem to get anymore. Uh, they're published by uh, Osborne. And um, uh, you might be able to find these on eBay somewhere, I suppose. And uh, one of the things I remember about them is that, that they illustrated computers by having little robots running around rooms, putting ones and zeros into pigeonholes. And uh, in, in my head, that's still how computers work. Um, does, anyone, does anyone else remember these books, or is it just me? One person remembers these books, okay. Good. I'm glad I didn't just make them up. I'm glad it's not a figment of my imagination. Um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, when I press the button on this uh, slide chain, the little robot in here is making a telephone call to the little robot in my computer. That's abstraction. It's about having you know little robots running around the computer. Okay. Um, so a uh, computer system really is just a series of layers of abstraction, starting right down at the sort of microcode level and then moving up to the way we communicate with it. Um, so uh, this is a computer. This is a very early computer. Anyone recognise this one? Yes, guess who's been on Wikipedia getting the public domain pictures? That's ENIAC, yes. Um, so ENIAC uh, was, uh, according to Wikipedia, so it must be true, um, was uh, the first general purpose electronic computer. And um, Turing complete, which means that you could use it to solve any computable problem, um, but it didn't have any abstraction. So if you wanted to... Uh, uh, if, if you wanted to actually, actually solve any problems on it, you had to move wires around and flick switches, and, and, and hopefully you'd get it to do uh, the thing uh, that you wanted it to do. So as far as computing power is concerned, this, uh, this Mac here and, and that ENIAC we saw before can solve exactly the same problems. It's just that we probably need an ENIAC the size of the planet um, to you know, implement IDRIS, but uh, in theory, it's, it's still the same, uh, same computing power. Um, so later on, we get, um, we get stored programs, so we get EDSAC, programs stored in memory as binary data. Obviously, that, that gets tedious after a while, um, you know, sticking to ones and zeros in pigeonholes like our robots in our uh, little uh, children's books. So, uh, so along comes assembly language, 
Uh, this is an EDSAC assembly language. This is, uh, I think it's a PDP-11 assembly language, which I've picked just because it's a very easy one to read. Uh, so you've got mnemonics for machine instructions, and you've got human readable notation. So we've, got, we've already gone two levels of abstraction up from our moving wires and flicking switches around. Um, so, okay, quiz time. Er, you, you must all recognize this. <laughs> this woman, yes. This is Grace Hopper. Uh, in our story, she's very important because, well, she, uh, she was very, uh, one of the de uh, designers of COBOL, if I remember rightly. Uh, we forgive her for that because she did many, many. Mama COBOL. Sorry, what? Her nickname was Mama COBOL. Mama COBOL. Right, okay. Um, uh, she also came up with uh, a AO, A0, the first compiler. Uh, not really a compiler, it was more a sort of linker loader. Um, so that converted the specification into machine code. And uh, she did this, apparently, she said, uh, because she was lazy, and she hoped that the programmer might return to being a mathematician. <laughs> so basically, it's, it's all about laziness. Everything we do is about laziness. Making new abstractions is about laziness. It's so that we can write down exactly what we mean, so we don't have to do the, the work of, 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 of telling the computer all the details of what we mean. We just want to tell it exactly what we want to do. Um, oh, just, just as an aside, uh, supposedly, again, this is according to Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, she popularized the term debugging. So this, this thing here is a, is a moth that was found in, in, in a machine. And the comment there says, uh, first actual case of bug being found. And apparently extracting this from the machine led to the, the phrase debugging. Um, this is probably not true. But uh, well, you know, why let the facts get in the way of a good story? Um, so Moving higher level still, we get to Fortran, we've got familiar mathematical notation, so we're getting closer to the program, programming languages we know and love. Uh, invented by a team uh, led by John Backus, who uh, later won the Turing Award and uh, gave a very nice lecture about can program be, programming be liberated from the von Neumann style, where he, uh, he, uh, he waxed lyrical about the promise of functional programming, so obviously we forgive him Fortran for that. Um, he also said, um, it's the L word again, much of my work has come from being lazy. Um, I, I didn't like writing programs, and so uh, you know, I started working on a programming system to make it easier to write programs. That's really what we're doing all, all the time here. That's everything that we're aiming towards with um, you know, higher-level languages and domain-specific languages, is making it easier to write programs for your actual domain. I mean, we love, because we're computer scientists, we love writing programs for their own sake. But, uh, but uh, outside of our ivory tower, people actually like to get things done, apparently. Uh, this is why we like uh, to, to, to make it possible to run programs, of course. Um, <coughs> <coughs> There's, uh, yeah, the active programmers in the corner are looking astonished again. Um, so, yes, after Fortran, we get more and more high-level languages. And they, they, I've picked a selection here for various reasons, uh, providing new abstractions. So, uh, you know, C being an abstraction over the operating system, I suppose. Uh, Go I picked for no reason other than I like playing the board game Go, and uh, when it was announced, I saw something on Reddit that said, uh, Go programming language, and I thought, brilliant, someone has finally made a domain-specific language, and it's possible to express strategies for Go. This will be fascinating, and then I was very disappointed. Um, but uh, still, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting new language that if you haven't looked at it, is, uh, is worth a look. Um, so there's a lot of programming languages around. Um, and yeah, I'm sort of going to give a, the rest of this lecture about how to make even more of them. Um, but this, this is, is an interesting observation made by uh, Peter Landin way back in 1966. Has anyone read this paper, The Next 700 Programming Languages? Um, a few people. If you haven't read it, I would suggest you go and read it. It is, it is a, a great piece of uh, programming language uh, research history. Um, there's quite a lot of papers begin with uh, the, the, the words the next 700 now as well, if you're talking about sort of generic ways of doing things. One thing he said in that is, uh, it's very early on in the paper, so it's not even be the opening sentence of the paper, is that most programming languages are partly a way of expressing things in terms of other things and partly a basic set of given things. So if we can come up with some generic way of describing things in terms of other things and then give a specific set of given things, that specific, specific set of things is our basically our domain uh, knowledge. That's how we write domain-specific languages. So, higher level still. This is where we're getting into more modern times. Um, so, uh, a domain-specific language is just a language that allows you to express things in a particular problem domain. Uh, typically, they work at a very high level of abstraction. So, 
as far as possible, you just want to write you know, what you need to know to get the job done. So a typically direct declarative, you just say what you want. You don't say anything about uh, how to do it. And they're quite often not Turing complete. And if a domain specific language is Turing complete, it might even be you know, by accident. Actually, it's quite surprising how many things are Turing complete. Um, so, uh, shed mode configurations, they're Turing complete. The Intel MM boot trap yeah. What was that? The Intel MM boot trap handler. I didn't know that. HTML5 wow. <laughs> okay. Right, so it's, it's actually harder to think of things that aren't Turing complete, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, cock is not Turing complete. Well, even that's not strictly true. Anyway, let's not go into that now. Um, <coughs> so a few examples. So you, you've all programmed in DSL, of course. Um, so, um, you know, database applications, HTML, R, Mathematica, so if you're doing scientific programming. Um, Unreal Script, so quite a while ago now. Um, so a, a domain-specific language for um, uh, a particular computer game. Um, also, I reckon this is a kind of domain-specific language. So uh, if, you, if you use email filters in your email client, the, the, this little dialog box that that you describe uh, email filtering is, is, is certainly a domain specific language. It's certainly a language because you, you have a set of rules that you describe. It's just that it doesn't have textual syntax. You don't have to have textual syntax to be a language. Or a music playlist. So any kind of configuration for software is also a kind of domain specific language. So um, we, we see these things all the time, high level expressing uh, kinds of domain knowledge. So um, what I'm, uh, one thing I'm aiming to do in Idris is to support uh, the implementation of domain-specific languages that you can uh, verify, that you can say you have strong properties about. And I'm going to start with something that's, uh, well, a lot simpler than uh, any of these uh, highly specialized languages. I'm just going to uh, do an implementation of the simply typed lambda calculus. So um, is this a language that, uh, or a formalism that we're all familiar with? Is anyone not familiar with it? Don't be shy. Okay, so everyone's happy with that. Um, so I'm going to show you just how to um, describe uh, the syntax in Idris and describe um, uh, an interpreter for that syntax in Idris. And then I'm going to say, show a little bit about how to, make, uh, how to make use of the Idris type checker to get the typing rules automatically for your DSL. So I'm going to start with something a lot simpler. I'm going to, it's it's the, uh, the simplest possible language I could think of to illustrate how to write an interpreter. Uh, and this is uh, something you could do in Haskell as well, um, or any kind of functional language. So our expression language here is we have values, which are integers, and we have a way of adding two uh, sub-expressions. So to write an interpreter for that expression language is, uh, is, is pretty simple. We just say, okay, we'll uh, uh, write an interpreter that takes an expression and returns an integer. If we have a value that's x, we just return it. And if we want to add, uh, one expression to another, we'll interpret the left-hand side of that, and we'll interpret the right-hand side, and then we'll add the results, and then we're done. Brilliant. So it's quite hard to write. Uh, I mean, the type system for this, the type system for this language is very simple. Everything is an integer, and so if every sub-expression is an integer, then there's no problem with with adding two integers together. Um, so everything here is going to be well typed uh, and well scoped. There's no there's no variables. So let's make it a bit more exciting. Let's let's add variables. Um, so I've just got strings for variables. And so if we're going to interpret uh, uh, expressions in this language, um, they, it might go wrong because the, 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 the variables that, um, that we use might not exist. So to interpret programs in this language, we're going to have to have um, a context mapping variable names to integers. So we've got here a list of, uh, list of pairs of strings and integers and an expression, and that returns may be an integer, because if, uh, if something goes wrong, if we look up a variable and it's not there, then we'll have to have some kind of error. So uh, again, just as before, if we got a value, we just return it and we ignore the environment. And, and adding things up, we interpret the left one under the environment, we interpret the right one under the environment, add them up. And if we have a variable, that's where something more interesting happens. Um, we have to look up the variable name in the environment. If it's not there, well, we've lost. If it is there, then oh, this is a type error. Actually, this is yeah. this is this is what happens if you uh, if <laughs> every case doesn't return. Maybe yes, yeah, thank you. This is what happens if you type things into a slide without running them through your type checker first. Um, so we, uh, if if we want to write 
if we want to write an evaluator for this language, it might return an error. And in this case, it'll return an error before we even run it. Um, <laughs> so, to write something, um, what, what we want to do is write an interpreter that only allows us to, um, uh, to write well-typed expressions, well-scoped expressions, where all the variables we have uh, we know are in scope, where every expression we have we know is well-typed. Um, and we want to add more than just integers and more than just, uh, more than just addition. We want to have uh, functions, we want to have uh, abstraction, we maybe want to have let binding. Um, and in order to do that, um, uh, we have to think about what types uh, our language is going to support. So um, I didn't go any further with this, uh, partly because I already made a type error. Uh, and partly because I uh, started thinking about how to do um, application of sub-expressions to each other, and really it gets quite boring because you have to do a lot of dynamic checking that the thing you have is in the right form. You have to check that you know, for values, you can have values being integers or booleans or functions, but you have to start thinking about what the structure of values is as well as the structure of expressions. And I thought, well, forget that. Let's just move on to the dependently typed language where we can express the types in some generic way. We could compute the, the result type of the evaluator, uh, and, and we can... Uh, we can do things rather more, uh, well, rather more precisely. Okay, so now starting to work on uh, the full simply typed lambda calculus. So the types we have available, I'm going to uh, I'm going to allow two kinds of primitive types. So I'm going to allow integers and I'm going to allow booleans, uh, and I'm going to allow uh, function types. So this is uh, you can read this as a function arrow. So it's a function from this type to this type. So Remember I mentioned yesterday that uh, in a dependently typed language, um, types are first class citizens, which means you can, uh, you can calculate types just like you can calculate any other value, uh, any other kind of function. So what we're doing here is we're translating our, uh, object language types. So I'll refer to, it, it gets a bit awkward with when you're implementing uh, languages, you, you have to start disambiguating the, the, the language you're implementing and the language you're implementing it in. So when I'm talking about the language being implemented, I'll refer to that as the object language. Uh, and when I'm referring to the language we're implementing it in, I typically refer to that as the meta language. So in this case, Idris is the meta language. And this uh, language we're talking about, this is the object language. So what we've done here, we've defined the object language types. And interp tie is a function that translates object language types into meta language types. So we're going to write this interpreter basically by translating object language programs into meta-language programs. So, interp tie translates uh, object language uh, types into meta-language types. For tie int, that just returns an integer, just returns int. Tie bool just returns bool. And tie fun st returns the function type from whatever s was to whatever t was. So, um, this is obviously never going to get run, this program, not at runtime anyway. This, this, is, this is going to get used by the compiler because we're calculating types. Types get erased at runtime. So it's going to get used at compile time to calculate the type of the rest of the program, basically. Everyone happy with that? I see some nodding. Um, good. Yes? I see a little bit of confusion. Uh, mostly nodding. Uh, do, 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 don't be shy about asking questions if there's anything a bit strange going on here. Uh, so a few more preliminaries we need before we get to the actual um, implementation of the language. Um, so there's a bit of an aside. Um, this data type, fin, uh, is uh, the type uh, representing finite sets. So finite sets are just uh, sets that com contain a finite number of elements. Uh, so fin of zero, that's the finite set containing zero elements, which is obviously the empty type. Fin of one, finite set containing one element, and so on. Um, so I can represent this by saying, well, S0, that is the first element of a finite set of k plus 1 things. Um, so I can always have the 0 thing as long as I have k plus 1 things available. And if I have the, an element of a set of k things, then its successor is going to be an element of a set of k plus 1 things. So actually, although I've called this the finite set, I could just as easily have called this bounded numbers, and it would have, it would have kind of meant the same thing. Um, so this is a good way of representing um, numbers with an upper bound, uh, which is quite convenient if you happen to have uh, uh, a vector of a certain length. So we have uh, here an element of a finite set bounded by n, and we have an element of a vector that has 
and things in it. So the bounds of these things are the same, which means that we know from the type of this, this index lookup function, there is no way that this number can ever be out of bounds because its bounds are the same as the bounds of the vector. So the zero thing, looking at the zero thing and a vector of um, containing x cons x's, that gives us x. Looking up the successor of k thing, well, we just go, we get the k thing from the tail, and that's, uh, that's going to be fine. Now, you'll notice that we haven't dealt with the empty vector here. So why do we not need to deal with the empty vector here? It's impossible. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? I've put, I've put an n there, so that n could be zero upwards. n gets instantiated to successor of something. Yeah, so n is going to get instantiated to successor of something because there's no way... In thin n, there's no way that n can be zero because neither of these constructors allows it to be zero. So because neither of these can have the index zero, there's no point in checking for the empty vector because neither of the because well we've already ruled that out. Do you have a question? So if, this, if you swap the thin and the vector, right? Uh, in this argument, will it still Yeah, it'll be fine because. Uh, what the, the way uh, the coverage checker works is basically generating all the other possibilities uh, from, from the cases that, that you've given and uh, checking them all. And if any of them type check, it says, hang on, you've missed one out here. And if, uh, so basically all of the other ones have to fail. So in this case, it will be checking F0 empty list, F, FS empty list, and it'll see that neither of them unify because one has to have a successor index, one has to have a zero index. Uh, right, so this means we can, uh, we can do bound safe lockup. We can know at compile time that a lockup isn't going to fail, so we know we don't have to do any of the checking uh, that we did um, incorrectly on our, uh, on our simply typed version before. Uh, <coughs> now, why did I show you that? Um, well, it's about the way we represent variables. So earlier we represented <coughs> variables as strings, just because that's the quickest way to represent variables in a, in a quick hack of, a, of an interpreter. But... Um, Actually, in practice, it's better to refer, uh, I find it's better to refer to variables by you know, how you're going to look them up in, in, in a context. So you have a context of, uh, of, of types and values, and uh, we, we represent variables just by their position in that context. So uh, this is um, uh, it's called a, a, a de Brown index. Um, if there are, are there Dutch people in the room? Because whenever I say de Brown index, Dutch people find that hilarious because I can't do it. <laughs> and I've been told that I shouldn't even try. But, um, de Braun himself uh, told me to call him De Braun. Right. <laughs> since, since it is the German word, uh, the German name Braun. Right. Well, uh, uh, British people normally just say Brown in, in a similar kind of uh, way. Anyway, um, so there's a Brown index. Uh, it doesn't have a name. It's just a, a number that counts how many uh, how many binders, how many how many uh, bindings ago it was it was defined. So you got this expression lambda x y dot x plus y. Well, this x was defined zero one binders ago. This y was defined zero binders ago. So you just say lambda x y dot first thing plus zero thing. So this takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a very easy way to implement the interpreter. So you've, basically you'll have a first step that, uh, that, that, that translates your name into an index, and then your next step will, uh, will just work with the index. Um, so if you have n variables, then um, thin n is going to represent a bounded uh, Brown index. So if you have zero variables, then clearly there's nothing in that vector, thin zero, just you know, there's nothing there. Um, so if you have a, a context G that is your vector of length n, and you have um, an index I, which is your uh, element of the finite set uh, with, uh, with, band, with the same bounds, then this is a bound safe lockup. Index IG is a bound safe lockup of that variable in the context. Right, so this is, this is the first step towards implementing a uh, representation of a language where we can't possibly have um, vector, uh, variable lockups that fail. <clears throat> right, so let's get on to a, a little bit of code. Now, uh, remember this using notation from yesterday, by the way. This, this just means that every time we see this G in, in, this, uh, in, in this block of code, it's going to mean that G is a vector of types. So this vector of types represents the types of all of our local variables that, that we have available in our uh, expression language. So 
if we have a vector of types, then we're also going to need uh, a list of values that correspond to those types. So when we're interpreting our programs, we're going to need to actually have access to those values. So this environment is indexed over a corresponding list of uh, types. So it's, it's a heterogeneous list, basically. It's, it's a list where uh, every element in the list has a possibly different type, which is determined by uh, the, the, the types in another list. So if you have an empty, uh, an empty context, so nil here, um, then you must also have an empty environment. If you have no local variables available in your uh, uh, type, then there's no point, you, know, you clearly can't have any variables. Um, if you have um, a context with A cons G, the context of A cons G, so something of type A and then the rest of the context, then you must also have uh, an environment for the rest of that context, and the value you have must be uh, whatever uh, type this A says it is. So we have an actual value here that is given by the type of A. Yeah? Is that, uh, people happy with that? Now, this has type predicate is, uh, is kind of what we were doing with lookup on the, uh, or index on the slide before. It's just that instead of representing it as a function, I've written it down as a predicate. Um, I've written it down as a predicate because um, I just find it easier to work with. It, it's, it, it's kind of, I'll, I'll, you, let me see when we get to the implementation why I think it's easier to work with. But this is just similar to the um, uh, list membership predicate we had yesterday. It's just slightly lifted up. It's, it's a context membership predicate rather than a, a list membership predicate. So given some index i and some list of things, so a fin n and, and a vector of n things, the zero thing in the context t cons g has type t, so it's just a statement. It's a sort of, uh, like before, prolong style statement that uh, uh, the, the zero thing in this context is t. And then if we know that the k thing in context g has type t, then we also know the, the successor of k thing in the context extended by u must also have type t. So this is, this is kind of a weakening rule, that if you add things to a context, then what you have um, is, uh, is you, know, you still have the same type. Uh, so I've called these constructors stop and pop, uh, which means that uh, you, can, uh, you can read, uh, again, you can read these just like natural numbers. So, you know, pop of pop of pop of stop is three, the third thing. Just like, you know, there of there of there of here was three, s of s of s of zero is three. We have a lot of different ways of writing down numbers, don't we? Um, it's, uh, pleasingly, it's possible to translate them all to machine integers if you, if you think carefully when you implement your, your compiler. So you don't actually have to worry about the internal representation of these things. They are just numbers. But they're very informative numbers. They're numbers that don't not only tell you what the number is, they tell you why they're that number. And if you want to prove things about your programs, which is, after all, why we're all here working with dependent types, is, you know, if we, we want to show that our programs actually work, you do have to do a little bit of um, additional work to explain why your number is a number. It's a number it is. But, uh, you know, you, the, the machine will at least translate it to something a bit more sane. Right, so uh, that's uh, context. Uh, so just to illustrate this, hammer that home a bit more, this is what an example might look like. So we've got a vector of two things here, an integer and a Boolean. The corresponding environment is going to have to have an integer and a Boolean in it. So the environment that corresponds to this context, you know, 42 from a true, so we've got an integer and a Boolean. Um, and then uh, a context membership proof, so proof that the second thing in that context is a Boolean would look a bit like this. So the successor of zero thing in context of type will, well, the proof just looks like a pop stop. So we're representing uh, variables by counting, uh, by uh, the Brown index that counts basically by saying the number of pops that we're going to do to get that, uh, to get that variable. Right, so um, let's, let's, let's have a look at the actual interpreter. Let's, let's see it running. And I, I know this one type checks because I've done it. <laughs> uh, right, I'm in the right directory. Yes, good. So uh, as, you, as before, you have all of this code available. So this is in the course code.pgz if you want to play with it later. Um, right. So we'll go back to the top. We've got our uh, interp tie that we, uh, uh, we just looked at. We've got our definition of environment. So um, yeah, we've got a lookup function that given some index, and given some environment, uh, returns the right type. This, this lookup looks remarkably like the index function we had before. Um, 
So it's it, it just the ordinary uh, list lookup. And right, now we have, having gone through all that, we have our description of uh, what, what an interpreter might look like, or our language might look like. So a variable, so before we had a variable being just represented by a string, here we have a variable represented by a context membership proof. So if we know that the i thing in the context g has type t, then we have an expression that, that uh, uh, has type t. Um, so you can kind of read these as typing rules almost. If you uh, if you look at it in a sort of sideways way, you can you can see that this is you know gamma proves expression has type t. Uh, so value I've just got integer values. That's an expression of type integer. Now lambda. So we're working in a nameless representation. We're working with the Brown indices. So for a lambda, what we do is for the scope of that lambda, we extend the, the context g with something of type a. So we, we, we have an additional variable available in the body of that lambda, and that gives us uh, a, a function type, function from A to T. So corresponding to that, if we have a function type from A to T, and we have uh, an expression of type A, then applying that gives us the expression of type T. Uh, here I've got arbitrary operators, so you, you can just embed uh, any operator that, that from the Idris language that works with um, expressions of the appropriate type. So I could do maybe addition or, or you know, less than, all of the, other, all the things we might accept, expect, provided that uh, we can work out what A, B, and C are in, uh, in the object language. And then finally, just to make it possible to write slightly more interesting programs, I've got um, a conditional, so, so if expressions. Right. Um, I haven't, however, written the interpreter for this. Now, um, the way we write the interpreter is well, the, way, the reason we've gone to all of this effort to write down the types of the language and, and, and work out how to translate object language types into meta language types is so that we can write an interpreter that simply translates to um, uh, host language, meta language programs directly. So given an expression of type T, what the interpreter is going to return is an Idris expression that has the representation of that type T. So if I look at, uh, for example, the type of var case, um, oh, that's not very helpful. Um, well, actually, it is very helpful because it, it tells us that it's going to be whatever the type of this uh, uh, the variable sub-expression is. So how is this going to work? Well, it's the, the, the type is going to be, we, we, we're going to have to look up the i thing in the environment we have available. So the only thing we can reasonably do is look up the i thing in the environment. Um, and yes, that type checks. That's good. So let's look at the type of val case. What does that give us? Well, we've got, um, can you all see that? It's like duck. Um, so we've got, um, we've got an integer. We need to return something of type interp psi of integer. So that suggests that all we have to do is return this x. Yeah, happy with that. Lambda is a bit more complicated. We have, we have uh, an expression in scope, uh, a scope here that has some, um, uh, there's going to be some function, to, or we're going to have to build some function type, and this, this scope is going to have to do something with uh, the variable that we introduce um, into the uh, environment. So I'll just do this one quickly. So we're going to have to make a function. The only way we can make a function is with a lambda, so let's make a function with a lambda. Um, and given that, that, that introduces a new variable that we can pass to, uh, to the interpretation of the scope. So let's interpret the scope with this x stuck onto the front of the environment and interpret the scope. Yeah? Let's see if the machine agrees. Good, that's reassuring. Um, application, well, what are we going to do? Anyone want to shout this out? How do we interpret an application? We've got two sub-expressions to interpret, which suggests yeah. we're at least going to have to interpret F and interpret S. So you're suggesting uh, interpret F uh, and apply that to the result of interpreting S. Yeah? Great. We haven't done any error checking yet. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Um, so uh, for an operator, well, it looks we're going to have to interpret X and we're going to have to interpret uh, Y. And given that our operator just you know, applies the result of that, it should simply be, uh, it should simply be that. Yes, good, thank goodness for that. 
And uh, if then else, well, say, we're just, all we're doing is directly translating to the host language equivalent uh, expression. Uh, then, I didn't actually need the brackets there, did I? Put that on a new line. I'm really having to resist laying that out more neatly for the sake of getting through this. So that's all, uh, happily, that's all, that's all worked. So, um, well, we should probably test this, shouldn't we? Would, would that be? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I've got a few test programs here. Now, um, as you can see, these are perfectly reasonable programs that are uh, perfectly safe to write. Uh, you just have to be able to uh, write in the underlying syntax. Now, if you're a Lisp programmer, you probably don't mind doing that. Um, well, I think you probably don't like using uh, the Brown indices for your variables, but uh, apart from that, you know, you just have to write in the underlying syntax. And um, I mean, the, the biggest one I have here is this factorial program. So this, this, this. Um, um, I've, I've got a laziness annotation here because otherwise it would interpret the function forever. Uh, so I have to interpret the function lazily just to make sure that facts doesn't, the factorial function doesn't run forever. Um, and it's quite a neat way of doing unit testing in, uh, in a dependently typed language. Um, so this, this type so, uh, let's write down the definition. Uh, oops, oh, so true. So it looks a bit like this. Uh, the only way of, uh, of constructing something of type so, uh, or the, the, you can only construct something, something of type so true. It's impossible to construct something of type so false. So this means that the only way this program is going to type check is if the factorial of 4 through our interpreter really is 24. So let's, let's find out. It did type check. I realize I've not shown you anything that doesn't type check today. So you, as far as you're concerned, I might have, uh, I might have fiddled this so that it always works. So, uh, well, that's reassuring. Um, can't unify so true with so blah. Uh, specifically, can't unify true with false. Well, that's a relief. We, uh, we're, we're glad it can't unify true with false. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, if, if you're uh, one of these ex you know, people who likes uh, unit testing as well as types, and you probably should be one of these people who likes unit testing as well as types, because you know, although you can know that your program is going to work, sometimes it's a good idea and so to, to test that it really does work. Uh, then, then we do have this uh, uh, rather extreme way of doing uh, unit testing. Let's comment that out. Oh, we could, we, I suppose we could compile and run it. And it'll print 24, so yay. Now, problem here is that um, I can't really reasonably claim that this is a usable embedded domain-specific language because you're not going to come along and start, well, you're not going to program in this language because it's just a simply type lambda calculus. But let's assume that we take it a bit further and we make it a more, uh, you know, a more useful language, which we will do in a, a little bit from now. To assume we've done that, you really want to have, um, well, this is neither readable nor writable, I suppose. That's, that's the problem. Remember I said yesterday, you know, programs are for uh, humans to read, only incidentally for machines to execute. So this is a program that's for a machine to execute, and it's not really for any other purpose. So, um, Fortunately, there's, there's, there's a lot of fairly obvious structure here. So, so you know, lambdas introduce variables, and, and, and we've, got, um, we've, got, we've got variables all over the place, you know, stop here, pop stop here. Um, and we have, in our uh, host language, we have lambdas. Uh, we have binding forms. So, so it would be nice if we could somehow exploit what we have in the host language to um, uh, make the object language more readable. What do we do? So here is the same uh, interpreter, um, so same language, uh, same implementation, but after defining um, after defining expressions, we explain what it means to be a program in that language, what 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 it means to sort of write down a program. So this DSL construct says, right, okay, we're going to have a new language called Expra. Uh, and in that new language, lambdas are going to be represented by lam, variables by var, and then index first and index next tell the system how to construct uh, the de Brown index from a specific variable. Which means we can now say, under this, under an expert, we can now use the address construct to build programs in this language. Um, 
I've added a few more things. So um, this is uh, this this dollar. If you're familiar with applicatives in Haskell, this this just gives you uh, and this is the, how we construct uh, functions under idiom brackets. So this one, uh, under idiom brackets, uh, you automatically get this this dollar uh, form. Um, we can also add uh, new syntax rules. So this this syntax construct says, if you if you see if the parser sees something in this form, then translate it to something of this form on the right hand side. So in square brackets, that indicates non-terminals, and and any anything that looks like an identifier is is considered a terminal symbol. So this just adds a new a new production to the grammar basically. Now obviously this is this is clearly possible to abuse. Uh, so so. Um, Please don't do that. Um, I think it could be argued that I'm abusing it here. By the way, uh, um, so I've added a, a couple of um, a couple of top level definitions. So I've overloaded uh, the equals and less than operators, and uh, it's perfectly reasonable, I think, to make our expression language parameterized by integers. So integer expressions in our object language, I think, it's perfectly valid to make that an instance of the uh, numeric type class. Because well, they are numbers. We just have a different way of uh, of, of writing them down. So I've, I've I've got so plus is just the operator plus, minus the operator minus, and and so on. Um, so that's our interpreter again. So just just like we had before. And now our programs look a little bit more like uh, like actual programs. So these are exactly the same programs as before. Um, just w w with the mechanical translation from from this form to the original form. And so, um, you know, this this lambda turned into a, a lamb in our object language. This x turns into the appropriate variable. We've got an x and y here. So this this turns into uh, into stop a uh, pop of stop. This turns into just stop. This y turns into stop. Um, oh, and I have the same unit test to make sure that uh, that it actually really still is the program. So I've used um, uh, idiom brackets in the implementation of factorial. So under this else, we're using the application, all, all, all the idiom brackets mean, mean here is that use the application from the object language rather than using the application from the host language. So now we have an object language program that actually, I mean, you still probably don't want to write in this language, largely because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just a simply type lambda calculus. But at the very least, you can look at this and believe that it is the program that, uh, that you say it is. Um, so that DSL notation is uh, just a way of making more readable programs and slightly more writable programs. Yes, question. <coughs> Uh, no, it might actually have been possible here. Um, it, it's so idiom brackets get translated directly to the yeah. name of the operators without putting the yeah. type Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've done that entirely because it makes it easier to do uh, this sort of this sort of hack. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily encourage doing it without thinking carefully about whether it's the right idea, but it's something that's available. It means also with do notation, you don't need to have a monad to use do notation. And if you're doing something that's quite a complex DSL, you probably don't want to make all of your languages an instance of monad just to, uh, just to be able to use do notation. Um, so I think it's a shame, actually, in Haskell that do notation and uh, monads are so, firm, you know, so strongly related. But uh, there you go. That's just my opinion. Right. So. Um, that's a pretty simple DSL. It's not a particularly useful uh, DSL. The domain is simply uh, programs that are harder to write than programs we can already write. So uh, we should probably think about how we might want to use this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of method. Um, so before I do that, just uh, oh, yeah, I'll go through what, briefly go through what all the syntax overloadings were. So um, DSL notation is. Um, you can also have let in here, so, so let allows you to overload let binding. Um, uh, otherwise, you have variables and you have uh, basically how to construct variables and how to redefine binders. So I think it's quite a lightweight notation and quite powerful, although also something that, uh, if you're not very careful, could go wrong. So you know, do, do take some care with it. Uh, we're also allowed to introduce new syntax rules. So this is how if then else in uh, in Idris is built, by the way. And it's also how um, the range syntax that we used yesterday. It's also how the range syntax is built. So, so um, a lot of syntactic sugar is something that you can construct using syntax rules rather than having them baked into the parser. Um, so this is this is a bit of a contrived example for for loops. But as well as having non-terminals here, you can also mark binders. 
So this, this, the fact that this S is in, in braces here means that S is, has to be in a binding position on the right-hand side. So we can make a for loop in the, the, the Python-style syntax uh, by saying, okay, we've got for X, X is a binder, in some list, and then a colon, and then the body, and that just translates to an application of this for loop function where this X on the left has become a binder on the right. Um, so there might be some situations in, in particular DSLs where that's a useful thing to do. Uh, there's one in the exercises, in fact. Uh, and one more thing, this, this one definitely should be used with care, uh, is, is implicit conversions from, uh, uh, from one type to another. But it's, it's, so Scala people love this sort of thing, uh, having implicit conversions for implementing domain-specific languages. Um, you often find that you have a constructor just because you need a particular uh, sub-expression form. Um, and it's quite obvious which constructor you mean when you, uh, when you write the program. So what I've got here is a language that has a val constructor. This is just some arbitrary language. I don't know what else this language does. And an implicit function underneath that says, okay, if you've got something of type insert i a and, and it didn't type check, well, try just inserting this implicit coercion and, and see what happens. So they're very restricted, these implicit coercions, uh, because you know, they're obviously quite, well, potentially quite error prone. Uh, so you can only ever have one at a time. The, the system will not chain implicit coercions. It'll, it'll just try applying one. And if, there, if there's any situation where there's multiple possible implicit coercions available, it will use none of them. So you have to decide carefully which ones you really want, and ideally set it up so that only one will ever be available at any given time. We're going to see a case in tomorrow, uh, the third stage lecture where this is absolutely vital to making things uh, usable. But in general, you know, I'm, I'm mostly showing you this because it exists. So I, 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 would, I would not encourage using it unless you really have a good reason. Um, before I show you the uh, resource thing, I want to do a little bit of an interlude because this is the only time I can think of where it really fits into the course of, of how to call foreign functions. Because I've, I've, I've said that Idris is a, a systems programming language before. And what I mean by that is that you, know, you can do operating systems interaction without too much difficulty. Uh, the way to do that is by, obviously, being able to call um, C functions or foreign functions from Idris programs. Um, it's quite neat, I think, that we didn't actually have to change the uh, parser or add any you know, high-level language features in order to do this. We just had to add a little bit of a, a tweak to the compiler. What we can do is describe foreign functions in Idris syntax just as it is. And we can, do, we can describe foreign function types because, of course, we can compute types from descriptions. You just saw that with uh, Interp type for uh, for our um, uh, for our expression language. <coughs> so we describe foreign types just as a basically a, a, a universe of types. We have foreign integers, foreign flows, foreign characters, and so on. This FNE is um, I wouldn't worry too much about that at the moment. This FNE basically is a translate it directly into the the, the address runtime system representation. So if you want to do some particular kind of low level hackery, uh, FPTR that's a void a void pointer. So if you have something like, I don't know, a file handle or, or any kind of uh, C data structure that you don't want to manipulate in Idris, but you do want to be able to pass around, that's what FPTR is all about. And FUnit is typically used for uh, uh, void functions, things, uh, C functions that don't return anything. Uh, so obviously, like before, we can translate these foreign types into Idris. So the obvious translation, Fnt becomes an int, Fflow becomes a float. Obviously, the runtime system has to know how to do the, the marshalling, but that's you know, that's, that's where the magic comes in. You, you, this is not something we have to add to, to Idris itself. Essentially what we're doing here in Idris is modeling foreign functions, and it's the compiler's job to work out how to run the things. Uh, but it means we can write down C function types, and we can translate them into an equivalent Idris function type. F yes? FPTR becomes PTR? FPTR becomes PTR. PTR is just an, uh, it's, it's an, it's a, it's a primitive type that you can't make in Idris. There are no constructors for PTR. The only way you can ever get one is from a C program. Um, so to build a foreign function call, we have this function foreign tie, take the list of input types and an output type and returns an Idris type. So I didn't give the definition of this on the, definition on the slide, but you can probably imagine that all this does is it constructs a function from all of these things to one of these things. That's all. Um, so, and then a foreign function call is a string, that's the function name, it's a list of the input types, an output type, and that gives you a foreign function of some type. And then finally, this make foreign, this is not defined. This is, this is in the library, the type is in the library, 
this is uh, the only magic. Uh, it's quite a lot of magic, but it's the only magic. Um, it's the only magic function. This is compiled specially, so any uh, any any compiler backend will need to be able to implement make foreign for this to work. By the way, as of last night, there is a Java backend for Idris. It's uh, it's in the uh, it's in the GitHub version. I haven't actually tested it because um, for some reason Max and Java don't mix very well. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if there's any, I don't know if there's anything going on there, but anyway, um, I, I, uh, so it, it, I'm told it works. Um, so uh, all of the, any backend that you implement, so the, the JavaScript backend, does your JavaScript backend do something special with this? Uh, this the, uh, the JavaScript backend works with the, with the foreign function stuff, yeah. Yeah, so you have to do something special to make foreign, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so as far as you're concerned as a, as a programmer, writing, um, uh, writing foreign functions, you just do things in this sort of form. To make a function from string to IO something, just use make foreign. Uh, plus, this, is, this is defined in the runtime system. It takes a string and returns a unit. You do have to fully apply them, um, un unfortunately, just because of the way make foreign is compiled, so I, I can't drop X out here, which is slightly annoying. But, uh, um, and then you know, getting a character, well, that just uh, doesn't take an argument and it returns a character. So a more complicated one is if we're dealing with uh, files. Uh, so a file is just some file handle and then a pointer. This is a pointer that we get from, uh, uh, from C. So to open a file, we have this raw function that just returns the pointer. So it calls file open with a string and another string for the uh, mode in which we're going to open the file and return some pointer. And then we have this little wrapper open file that uh, mode is a, is a higher level description of the file access mode, which could be read, write, or read, write. Uh, by the way, uh, something I forgot to mention yesterday is that, you know, unlike Haskell, you have to write top-level type declarations for, for address functions because um, type inference and dependent types don't mix in general. However, in this case, it's completely obvious what the type of mode string is going to be from, from its first use here. You can t obviously, the, the, this position here has to be a string, and the, uh, the mode, we, we already know no, it's a file mode, so we don't need to write a type declaration for mode string. So otherwise, in general, you do need to write type declarations. But for simple things, um, it's, it's, there is a clear definition of what I mean by simple things. I'm not going to say what it is here because um, it's a bit long. Um, but uh, typically, you, you'll need a type declaration, but here you didn't. Right. Now, final thing for today, um, I'm going to talk about a, a more practical use of uh, this, this DSL approach. And uh, it, it arrives from this. This, this is a, a quote from uh, Joe Armstrong, who designed Erlang. Erlang, and this this was said by Joe to uh, my colleague Kevin Hammond in a pub in Tallinn. So, if there's anything that is more true than what you hear from on Wiki, or what you read on Wikipedia, it's what you heard from a man in a pub. So, this is clearly true. Uh, nobody in industry cares whether a program does what it's supposed to do. They just care with how it behaves about how it behaves when it's when it's run. So, you know, if your program gives the wrong answer, you just sort of, you know, fiddle and try again. If it crashes, well, that's kind of annoying because you've, you've got to reboot. Uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to restart your software. You've got, you, you've got to get, download the new version. Um, so, you know, this, this is something that particularly they care about in the Erlang community because they're very interested in keeping things running. Um, so, this is uh, extra functional correctness rather than functional correctness. So, the, the distinction we make, um, between functional correctness and extra functional correctness is functional correctness is about does the program do what it's supposed to do? So, you know, does your sort function return an ordered permutation of its input? Does does x plus y always equal y plus x? That kind of thing. Um, you know, is your list lockup always bound safe? Um, extra functional correctness is more about does the program uh, run within the required resource constraints? Does does it manage resources correctly? You know, does does it run within a megabyte of RAM? Well, the answer is, I believe, always no these days. Um, I had a student, by the way, who we were doing, uh, this was just, just the other day, this is completely off topic, so I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, it was, they were doing, they're learning C, and, and I told them not to use um, uh, get s for reading strings because of the possibility of buffer overflows. And this student said, uh, I use get s, and it's okay because I initialized the uh, string array with max int characters, so I knew it wouldn't be possible to overflow. And I said, great, you don't have a buffer overflow. The only problem is I want to run another program while you're reading your text. So um, 
It was a it was a novel approach to the problem, though, and and I'm I'm, I'm glad I'm you know I'm glad they're thinking about it. Um, anyway, so this is a kind of extra function. Functionally, it was clearly correct. This extra extra functional uh, question of, of of is it going to run within a reasonable amount of memory? Well, maybe not. So um, I'm going to go through the, the the simplest possible resource example that I could think of, um, basically because you know it's, it's very easy to understand files. Um, and it's actually very easy to get them wrong if you're not very careful. So uh, a pr any program which manages files has to um, uh, use files in a way that conforms to uh, a simple resource usage protocol. So informally, before you uh, read or write a file, that file has to be open, and that open has to have succeeded. So if you open a file and it didn't work, well, actually, you typically just plow on and assume it did work, and then things will go wrong. But you, you have to make sure it's worked. And, and, and you can't do any, you know, it doesn't make sense to work with the file before it's been opened. Uh, if you have opened a file for reading, then there's no point in trying to write to it, uh, vice versa. And uh, when you finish processing, you should be closing the file, because if you keep files open the whole time and your program is running all day, then you're going to run out of file handles. So uh, what we're going to see now is a uh, domain specific language extending this idea of the, the, the simply typed lambda calculus interpreter. Um, but which encodes, in general, a resource usage protocol. So we, we're going to be separating, just like Peter Landon said, we're going to be separating the basic set of given things from the way of um, uh, the, the, the um, way of expressing things in terms of other things. So this is going to be the program that we end up writing. Uh, this is a resource-safe file management program. It looks a little bit like um, Monadic I/O. Looks a little bit like Monadic I/O. There's a couple of differences. So this is an I.O. here. So if you're a Haskell programmer, you'd expect to see I.O. In, at the top of an I.O. program. Um, this is res. This means it's res resource safe. And we've got a little res here uh, that, that suggests something funny is going on. Now, um, if you've been paying attention, you'll probably realize that this res is defined using DSL notation, and something funny is going on underneath. The fact that this program type checks, it does type check, by the way. Um, this one I have tested. Um, uh, this one does type check. The fact that it type checks means that it is a valid implementation of the resource protocol that we were talking about. So if I forget to close the file, for example, it isn't going to type check. Or if I try to open it twice, it's not going to type check. Or if I don't have this thing that checks whether it opens successfully, uh, it's not going to type check. But you can't see any dependent types in here. Um, what we're really aiming at here with, with implementing domain-specific languages is, is using dependent types to make sure that everything works, everything is managed correctly, and there are no possible uh, runtime errors behind the scenes, but having a language in which someone who just wants to write programs can get things done. So, so a programmer using one of these DSLs really shouldn't have to understand what a dependent type is in order to be able to do something useful. Right. So last thing for this lecture, I'm going to show you uh, fairly briefly how this works. Because um, it, is, it is quite an involved example, and if you really want to get uh, the details of what's going on underneath, you'll probably have to uh, stare at it for a little bit longer than we have available. Um, so, right. So, it's, uh, it's in your um, uh, uh, course code directory again, and it's the uh, file res program, and it makes use of the resimp uh, module. So, um, there we are, type checked. And uh, there is the program, just to, just to prove that it's this program that's type checked. So what happens up the top, I'll work backwards again. I'll start at the program, and I'll work backwards towards the DSL. Um, so we're going to define why we're opening files. So we're opening them either for reading or writing. Just for the sake of simplicity, I've left rewrite out here. Um, so, um, and instead of files just being a file handle, that could be in any state. Well, file handles are file handles that are open for some purpose. File handles exist for a reason. They exist to be either read or, or written. And if they, if, uh, if 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 the file is closed, then the file handle doesn't exist. That's basically what we're saying here. Um, so, opening a file. Well, there's this uh, mysterious creator. Uh, uh, here. This, this basically means this is an I.O. function which makes something new. And it makes either something broken, it makes either an empty tuple, or it successfully makes 
the file handle. So we've got a bit of checking here. We open the file. This is just the underlying raw file open thing. Um, if it's a valid file, so this basically means if it was successful, then return the, um, uh, the file handle. Otherwise, return just the empty tuple. Uh, so we also have updaters. So close updates the status of something. So given a, a file on the way in, it gives something empty on the way out. So that exposes the file. And then we have readers, and these are things which neither create nor update. They just keep something in the same state. Uh, so end of file is also a reader. A little bit of sneaky syntax overloading here. So we're working in a DSL that allows you to apply creators, updaters, and readers. So closing a file is an updater. Reading a file is the user. Uh, end of file test is just a user, user using a resource. And then uh, possibly not surprising to notice that, that if opened is also uh, is also a bit of syntax overloading. It's kind of cheating there. But check is a check is basically the if then else of our resource language that uh, that, that, that will uh, take a um, uh, something aside either, and it will pick the branch according to what was in the either, but it will carry through the evidence that it's in the right branch. So when you go into the, the this branch, we'll have the evidence that. Uh, that the file exists, and when we go into this branch, we'll have the evidence that the file doesn't exist. And then we have the program. So, what does the language itself look like? Well, this is the language itself. I've been good to you here. I've even written comments. Um, so, like before, we're parameterized over an environment, or a, a, sorry, context of, of, of the types we have. The difference is we, we're, 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 we're consuming things. So we're working with resources, so things are in a different state as we go through the program. So we have types on the way in and types on the way out. So this is, this is, the, this is where the resource magic really happens. So let, let binding, takes something that creates a new resource, so it's got to be a creator function, so like open. So, so when you open something, you're just passing into a, a let binding. So you'll have noticed that we had uh, a let binding here. So this open has to be a creator. Uh, and then it creates a new, uh, the, the scope of this is a, a new resource program where on the way in, we have something of type A, and on the way out, we have something that's been eaten, basically. So this, this type here of this, the scope of this let binding says, you can do whatever you like with, that, uh, with, with the, the rest of the context, as long as by the time we get out, you finish with the thing you just created. So you always have to clean up after yourself in, in this language. Uh, what updaters do is, given some proof that uh, we have something of the right type in the context, update it to the new type. So we've got something that goes from A to an updater of B, just update the value of type A to a value of type B. And users, uh, well, they just don't do anything to the context. So, so gam on the way in, gam on the way out. That's all the resource magic here. The rest of it is just uh, control structures to write uh, um, to write you know, programs more easily. So you know, we can lift arbitrary I.O. actions, we can do dynamic checking, we've got while loops. And then we've got return and bind because that just gives us do notation for free. So the rest of this is just, it's the expected thing. It's the, the interpreter is exactly as before, exactly the same style as before, that we, um, um, you know, we, we, we just translate the, the program that we've got into the, the host language, the object language program into the host language program. I've done a little bit of trickery to do continuation passing style because it's just a neater way of passing through, you know, returning two results at once, I suppose. Uh, and then eventually, a uh, final bit of magic is um, the SL notation. So we just said, well, okay, whenever you've got a variable, well, actually, I've, I've represented variables. I don't have a specific construct of variables here, but I do have specific constructors for um, building um, context membership proofs. Whenever you see a let, instead of using the address, the let, use the object language let, and uh, whenever you've got to see this res, well, just turn it into a resource program that has the same set of resources on the way out as on the way in. Uh, question, yes? Is there any checking of um, the DSL thing? It, well, it we plug salt or end salt without, and then, then the checking? Uh, yeah, so it, this happens before type checking. So, um, the, yeah, that, uh, if, if you do something here that, that doesn't make sense, you're going to get a type error. It might be a slightly mysterious type error. By the way, actually, I, I would love to be able to describe this DSL notation in terms of type classes, and I haven't quite figured out how to do it. So if anyone can work out how to do it, that would be, uh, that would be rather fun. 
Um, this, would give, this would give type to this tool. Yeah, I, um, so basically like you can have um, you know, do notation that you can describe as a monad type class, but I'm not sure that's the way I would like to do it. But it would be nice if you could have some kind of DSL type class where you could explain all of these things. I'm not sure it's really necessary, but it would be nice. It would be just, th this is somewhat ad hoc, and it would be nice if, if you could explain it in a more um, sort of um, principled way. I don't know if it's possible, but it would be, it would be, it would be nice if, uh, if someone worked out that it was. Uh, okay, so that's all I have for today. Um, the exercises you have for today are all about implementing new uh, constructs for DSL. So it, it, implementing an imperative DSL. It's rather simpler than this resource language, but slightly more complex than the, uh, than the, uh, the, the evaluator language. Um, I would also say, though, if you didn't get through all of yesterday's exercises and, and you'd like to carry on with them, then that's perfectly fine, too. Uh, you know, please you know, don't, don't rush ahead if you, uh, um, if you haven't quite got earlier things yet. Um, one more thing, just one final thing. Normally by now, if someone says, what happens if you don't, uh, if you don't close the file? <laughs> You're about to ask that, yeah, okay. Um, well, this is what happens. Uh, you get an error message, which, so the way error messages are presented, you might have noticed this, is, is you, you, they, they tend to be presented in two forms. So you get a full one that says the whole thing that went wrong during type checking, and then you get a cut down one that says the specific thing that went wrong during type checking. Now, it's not always clear which one of those is going to be more useful. In this case, well, you see this first one, and, and um, I can tell you how to read that. You read that as saying, it went wrong. This second one is a little bit more helpful, because it says, well, you've got a, you were supposed to have a, a, a unit thing, but you had a file that was open for reading. So we've got to the end of the block, and we don't have, uh, we don't have the files. So that's what happens. Uh, right, okay, I'll stop there, and uh, let's have uh, a tea break, uh, and uh, and get back to the hacking. Okay, thank you.